so if you if you get directions to their right here directions yeah okay and then write in your starting points type in s a n e i s a n e i e i a g o oh okay but space m a r m a not not n a like m as in mommy mm -hmm. okay first one first one and then maybe you can zoom out for people to oh there you go so I, oops what happened uh okay so Santiago Marabatío is the town in Guanajuato, Mexico, where my mother is from, and that's where she was born. Um, it's a very, very small municipality in the state of Guanajuato. And my father is from Barrio. He was born in Barrio Uno, which is um, just outside Buenos Aires, near their main airport. And somehow these people wound up meeting in Mesquite, Texas, which is a dry county, um, which is odd because my dad likes to drink. And then I wound up in Miami um, seven years after they got married. And um, I was gonna show pictures of my parents because um, they've kind of become central to the work, but both of my parents come from very large families. They both have um, seven, eight siblings. So I have a total of like 50 first cousins from both sides of my family. And um, my parents were pretty much the only ones here in the States for a long time. Um, my mom had her brother lived in Texas and my dad had a brother that lived a few hours north from us but other than that they we were pretty alone here and I think in I grew up with a lot of longing both of my parents longed for their home countries longed for you know the, the warmth of the people they knew um, their customs and I also grew up flying to Mexico and Argentina on a somewhat periodic basis um, and then I grew up here in Miami in Sweetwater, which is not far from FIU actually. And, um, you know, Miami's very Cuban and I didn't have a lot of Mexican or Argentinian relatives or friends growing up. And so kind of felt alone and perpetually out of place as, you know, a lot of artists say, but I, you know, place was a big thing for me. I'm like, where, where is my home? Where is it that I feel comfortable? Um, and who, and who am I really? Um, because I didn't really know these places thoroughly either. So um, if you could go out to my website now. Okay. Which is just my name, dot com. Okay, hold on. So I grew up and really into playing The Sims um, and kind of playing pretend and orchestrating these like I'd, I'd come up with a restaurant and then make a menu, design it, have my parents sit down, heat up spaghetti and like serve them and pretend to be a restaurant owner and make them eat it. I'm like, come on, like I just heated this up and I designed this menu. Um, and I also like playing The Sims um, because I think it, it was fun for me to fabricate these narratives and imagine people's lives and um, I, and, and along with playing The Sims, I really liked writing growing up. Um, I read a lot. And although I, I read a lot, and when I would write short stories of my own, I never, I never put myself in them or my own experiences because I'd somehow become convinced that um, my name didn't belong in, um, in, in fiction just because there were no other people I'd whose lives I've been introduced to via book who looked like mine or resembled mine. Nobody had, you know, immigrant parents who pronounced Thanksgiving as Thanksgiving, and, you know, that was like a thing that annoyed you and you felt embarrassed by. Um, so I just kind of like scrapped myself out of my writing and I decided to whitewash it essentially. Um, but, you know, before, something happened while I was at FIU um, in my undergrad a lot of things happen. Um, one of them is I was a little bit frustrated with my circumstances. Um, sorry to admit, but initially I, I didn't want to go to FIU and I went because I couldn't afford, I mean, I had a full ride, but I also couldn't afford other things. And um, I, I really needed a job. And the only thing I could find was a human resources job. And I was like, man, 
I can't even get a job at a museum. I applied for a job at the ICA then, my current employer, an internship, and they turned me down. So it's just like, whatever, I'm guessing I'm going with this HR job. How is this going to feed my creative practice? I don't know, but here we go because it's the only job I found. It was on campus, convenient, et cetera. So I got my HR job. Needless to say, it was very boring. Sorry if any of my HR coworkers are here. You know it's true. Um, I think I remember when you were doing the exhibition, you were afraid that some of your, uh, your supervisor or something was going to show up. At yeah. The yeah. So you see, I, if you click on the HR human resources, a little desktop. Yeah. Right there. Um, so I did this whole work. This is my BFA thesis work about working at HR at FIU. And I show this work at FIU. And um, I talk a lot about the practices of HR and, and my department specifically in my work. Um, so I actually, a lot of this work I made at, within human resources because I would use their printer to print all my materials and I would use their scissors and I would use their tape. Um, if you can click the manual where it says click here, the here's in bold. So this project actually started out um, on paper, all in text. As I was saying, I really liked writing as a kid. And um, at the beginning of undergrad, I tried painting, but that wasn't going well for me at all. I just kind of sucked at it, I think. It, it just wasn't, it wasn't working for me. And then somehow, I think going to a couple museums, encouragement from William, a William McGuire who's here, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna start using my writing and my visual work. If you could stop on this one. Okay. Um, so this whole manual I found online. I just Googled human resources manual. Google is kind of like my, my ultimate thrift store for appropriated material. I just, you know, whatever I want to find, there's so many things on there. Google is evil. I must say that, but you know, it's been very useful for making my work. So I found this human resources manual that was just titled human resources manual. And, um, I decide, and, and this, the summer of 2016, I, were, I was working in HR and it was very boring. There was nobody on campus and I had nothing to do. So I had to go there and look busy. So I decided I was going to start writing about work every day while at work. And I would type on my computer, you know, when they think I'm writing emails, but I'm actually writing poems about being bored in the office. So I was like, I'm going to do this every day for I don't know how many weeks. I didn't do it every day, I tried to, you know, but I ended up writing like 15 poems. And, but I didn't call them poems because I didn't think I was good enough to be a poet at the time. I was like, these are texts, you know, like more abstract texts. So I decided to embed my texts in this human resources manual wherever I saw them fit. So I think this was actually titled Basic Protocol and um, I'm relaying the instructions for deleting somebody who would die on a spreadsheet. Um, when an individual is deceased, please make the necessary adjustments to the database, select the individual on the list and all accompanying information and then hit delete. 2,175 people remain on the list. Now enter the individual's name under the deceased tab in your spreadsheet and so individual lives on. Additional notes, use the standard condolence message to share moments of grief. I am so sorry for your loss. With deepest sympathy, sign with LaserJet printer. Um, if you could go back to my website. For okay. Let me see. Um, and click the photos. Oh, sorry. Back to the HR. Go back to HR. Mm -hmm. And go the these photos. So if you click, yeah, on the little slideshow, if you could click on that, I'm trying to look at the one by the water fountain, that one. Um, ah. 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 I think if you click on the keeps, middle. It just keeps sliding, sorry. Okay, well anyway, I initially presented the work, all these texts on the wall and um, people told me nobody wants to read that, it's too much. And I was like, well, you know what? That's your loss, but I was like, maybe they're right. You know, I have to find a way to make this a little more interactive, like I had planned for this talk, but Zoom um, got in the way. And so I, I came up with a video. I was like, I'm gonna translate these into video format. And so I thought PowerPoint 
was obviously the best way to do that. And if you scroll down, Colette, and can you hit three channel video? This one. Oops. Oh, oh. Hold on. This is the. All right, not this one, correct? Not this one on Vimeo. This one. The three channel, yes. And then if we can full screen, that would be nice. Thank you. And welcome to the Division of Human Resources. I will be guiding you through the Human Resources Manual to get you started. We will be going over a number of points essential to our functioning. The basic protocol. When an individual is deceased, please make the necessary adjustments to the database. Select the individual on the list in DAW. Accompanying information. And then hit delete, delete, delete. 2,175 people remain on the list. Now enter the individual's name under the deceased tab in your spreadsheet. In so, individual lives on. And now, we shall discuss authority. Your boss man is in a good mood. He hasn't told you yet, but you know soon. Boss will be getting it on. He will be making love, love making, or maybe, maybe. Not in a SFW. Maybe he'll fuck. He's in a good mood. Cause he thinks he's in love. Behavior in public and the time. Human resources manual, section 10 to 4. And now we shall discuss basic dress. The wearing of casual wear such as jeans, t-shirts, and sports shoes, etc. is not permissible except on Saturdays and Sundays if employees are required to report for duty in special circumstances. Note to department heads, heads of division, department should ensure that their subordinates are dressed in an appropriate manner when discharging duties. HR Rule 101, pretty people get what they want. So you're encouraged to shine your pride and wear your absolute best when soliciting. Wear a smile. Wear nice shoes. Show a little cleavage. But most importantly, utilize and maximize your human resource. Do not write notes on your pen. Do not write notes on your pen. They will look at you. Do not write notes on your pen. Do not write notes on your pen. They will look at you. Power flow and control. is a breast, nipple, areola, free area. Please be advised that the workplace vicinity is not a good place for breastfeeding. And please visit or contact the Human Resources Department if you wish to schedule a breastfeeding appointment for the product of your womb. You are reminded that this is compliant with the wishes of our department and the safety of our public. You will nod in compliance as he stares into the dark crevice of your shirt. Um, so that was a three channel video installation and Colette, if you go back to my website, the monitor in the center was actually quite small and it was placed above a podium that was in a corner. Hold on. And, um, yeah. Let me and see. then these videos that had the crotch zoom ins, um, were on these larger monitors. Let me go back. Let me see. I'm having issues myself. I'm going to go to which, which he is just human resources. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
um, and so you, I, there was this podium, right? All these chairs set up facing the podium and um, on the podium, there was a sign that said, Vi visiting speaker or speaker will be arriving shortly. Please wait, please stand by. And so the videos were running all evening. Well, they, you know, while the show was up, it's right here, that image that you just saw left. Um, but there, yeah, no speaker ever showed up. And the, the height of the monitor above the podium was, you know, there was no space for anybody to fit there. But the night of the opening, people came up to me. They're like, oh, are you performing? Like, what's this? What's about a speaker? And then I'm like, haha, you fell for it. There is no speaker. Um, but this project, I guess, is really monumental. I think to date is probably the project that I've, I've worked on for the most extended amount of time. And um, it got a lot of other things rolling, me working with video specifically and text and playing with language, which I think in sitting in this HR office, I, I really thought about the language they use more than anything. And like I thought of myself as a human resource and came up with all these puns and wordplay for office culture and you know the misogyny that was still present there so you know it, it is about working in hr and being bored but it's also about so many other things um and well i really I, like this project i really like maybe because i worked in hr too one time in my life so it brought back memories but i really like the whole um conceptual part and you know, you, you're writing some of the poetry while you're there. It reminds me of some of these um, writers that I hear about that are writing novels while they're at work, you know, on company time, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that's exactly kind of what I was doing. Sorry, FIU, but thank you so much. Um, if you could go back to my main page. Okay. So after a Human Resources debuted, I decided I was like, on a roll and I needed to keep going. So I decided to go to grad school, which I had no idea what I was getting myself into until I got there, of course. Um, and if you would scroll down, Colette, there's a folder called songwriting on the right. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I, I was in the writing track, the MFA writing track, but um, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. But our, the program there, the MFA program is very flexible and so I took classes from a bunch of other departments. I took a class in the sound department, photography, painting, and that first semester I had a class in the sound department and I knew a little bit about sound art but I'd, I'd never really exper experimented myself and um, we were looking at scores and I just, I kept on thinking, well, while I was at school in Chicago, I, I, I imagined that there would be more Mexican American folks, um, Maybe because that's what always came to mind for me when I thought about Chicago. I'm like, oh, there, there's a lot of Mexican people in Chicago. And I've never grown up around a big Mexican-American community. So I was excited to have that. But the student body did not really reflect Chicago's population whatsoever. And um, for the first time in you know, my life as a student, I found myself the only Latina in a room. And um, I think that was really shocking because I'd, I'd make certain references in my work and nobody would get them. They'd fall flat. It wasn't funny. Or I felt that they were being um, reduced to, to nonsense, you know. And um, I'm like, I'm talking about really serious issues here. I'm talking about neoliberalism and Latin America. And people are like, you know, your work reminds me of YouTube poop. Why don't you look that up? I see some similarities in your sense of humor. And um, that was, it was shocking. And so I think that really changed the way that I approached making as a Latina artist and um, the kind of attitudes that I wanted to have in my work. And it, you can't click on these um, and zoom in. Or Let me see on, is there one in particular? If you, could, if you could just click, I feel like they'll stop and you choose when to move them. No, is that not possible? No, it's not. Mm -mm. Okay, so um, these are these set of scores, sound scores. Their, their titles should have known incomplete works, and I kind of frame myself as a composer. It says three original musical compositions by Itzel Alexis Basualdo. I grew up playing classical piano, and I'd buy these booklets. It's like oh, the classics by Frederick Chopin, 
And I'm like, wow, I'm going to pretend I am, you know, a Frederick Chopin, but instead I'm going to make, um, I'm going to make pieces like, can you, can you press on the next one? I think it's stopped. Um, this one's titled Biografia and the instructions are just sing as you popularly wish. And, um, I kind of go through different pronunciations of my name as I've experienced and as the name itself has evolved throughout time. Um, my name itself is Aztec in origin, but um, the Spanish changed the spelling of the name and changed the pronunciation. So I, when you look up my name, you know, you'll get like a bunch of different meanings, but the meaning of itself or Ichel has actually been lost because of um, colonial translations. And so um, I start with Ichel and then it says, um, so, uh, situated in this locus of power, this version, or actually I can just pull it up on my website and read it. Um, but I start with Ichel and then I go to the way that the Spanish wrote it um, in their documents not long after arriving to Mexico. And then after that, I go to how I, how I write my name. Um, your pronunciation, yeah, it says your known pronunciation also very much like itself, which is sometimes when I'm telling my people, this is how you say my name. I say itself or itself with, you know, like selling something or itself minus the F and instead of an S it's a Z. Um, but then, I don't know, people have gotten into the habit of calling me eat cell or it's zell, you know, like really emphasizing the Z or some people call me it's soul, which I, that one I kind of really have a hard time with. And then it goes from it's soul for a year to it's soul, ha ha. And then I've gotten jokes, Excel, like Microsoft Excel, LOL, Axel, Excel, Giselle, Giselle, Yisel, Karen, Michelin, Asprax, Spaghetti, Zucchini, it's not my fault, my mom, your mom gave you a hard name. It's a complicated made up story, lost in colonialism. And I wanted to have a, a choir read these, like an actual choir, but I didn't get to that part of the project, um, unfortunately, but I think it's on my to-do list. Um, and then I, if you could scroll through another one. This one was, um, this one I really like, it's called Ode to Being American. Um, the instructions are requires two persons minimum, but can just can but, but can be performed with many persons representing the question and just as many or more, many more representing the answer interviewer and respondee question. What's it like to write in English for you? Answer I am American. Uh, answer I was born here. Answer as in this country answer in Miami, that's where I was born, answer I grew up here, answer I went to school here in this country, answer so no. Um, this was, I was asked, what's it like to write in English for you by an administrator at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She asked me this upon hearing that I was Mexican and this was my actual response. Um, so again, I'm here like bending typography, playing with language or displays of language. Um, Cause sometimes I always think like different fonts give off different moods and. Um, yeah. That's correct. I agree with you. I, and I think um, I've had actually a, a discussion about different fonts with my director, John Stewart about typography. And so he's very interested in that. So. If, um, there's another one on there, but I think we should keep moving. If okay. You go to my main page. So go back to the main page. Yeah. Okay. Also, while I was in grad school, um, there was with the election of Trump, uh, this anti-immigrant rhetoric I feel like was flooding the news, and then you had talk of building the wall. This obsession with you know erecting this, I don't know, border between two nations. And um, I, I am the child of immigrants. Um, my dad had to cross the border at one point. Um, my parents were both formerly undocumented illegal aliens, if you will. And um, this issue, well, hearing this vitriol 
was really painful and um i decided to respond with borderline it's a folder on the right under publications i was Madonna's kind of like my guilty pleasure and there's this one sign song by Madonna called borderline and I was like listening to borderline walking to school and um, And then the rest is history Can you use full screen? The text at the end comes from a poem by Juan Felipe Herrera. It's titled Border Bus. And in the poem, this Honduran woman is, she's relaying her experiences trying to cross the border and she's now being sent back to Honduras. And uh, Colette, can we go back to my yes. page? So there's a spin-off of that project that's called DJ Tony Computadora and it's on the left, but that's another three minute video. Um, you mean to you mean to open that? I was yeah, gonna please. ask if anyone has questions or comments to put them in our chat function. Do you want me to hit this? Um okay. go yeah. ahead. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So DJ Tony Computadora is this fictional character that I invented. Um, he is an artificially intelligent DJ and he was trained on the lyric on the salsa lyrics of over 50 songs. Um, and I asked DJ Tony to create a song, um, having learned all these lyrics. Um, and then I also trained him on the melodies of these same songs and I asked him to create a melody. Um, and this is all true, by the way. I've just named AI, um, this AI I created, DJ Tony. Um, and DJ Tony is going to, um, he's going to entertain you all this evening for a few minutes. So if we can just look at the first, like, Two minutes, collect. Buenas noches, buenas tardes, todos que se ven. Bienvenidos al karaoke, me llamo Tony Computador. Soy un místico que es la mente inteligente. Me han entrenado con las letras de las canciones de todos los hombres favoritos de tu mamá. Y no te preocupes, uno les pide que no tiene papeles. He trabajado muy duro, me memorizo. 
realizado las letras de Santiago, Frankie Ruiz, Gilberto Santa Rosa y muchos más. La última canción es una composición mía titulada Tu Amor. Solo podrán disfrutar unos pocos segundos por mi posible colaboración con la cómica Madonna. Están listos para el party. Aquí vamos. everybody hear me yes so um i initially the project started off as i'm going to see if ai is able to pick up on the misogyny that i thought was present in a lot of you know salsa songs that i grew up listening to um backstory to that is because i didn't have a lot of latin people around me i became that like loud neighbor that used to annoy me in miami that was like always blasting salsa music That was me in Chicago. And I was like, man, I started thinking about the lyrics. The more that I listened to the songs, I'm like, these lyrics are messed up. You know, they're talking about like women in just such an awful way. And, and, and it goes hand in hand with the machismo of the culture. And I'm like, let's see if AI can pick up on this. And although a lot of it is nonsensical, it, there are some words there like bruja, culiada, um, and... And then after, I was like, you know what, I, I'm going to mesh this project somehow, even though it doesn't really make sense in my head entirely, with a karaoke of Borderline, because I wanted people to feel more implicated um, than being a simple viewer. And so I set this up in this gold room. I painted the walls of my studio with gold metallic paint and the floors as well. And there was... Um, the video projection, a microphone in the middle, and people came into my studio and decided whether they were going to sing or not to the song. Um, a couple of them did, unfortunately, which is actually what I didn't want to happen, but the allure of the karaoke, I don't know. Um, and there's just one more project before I read my final poem. Okay, go back one more time, hold on. Yeah. I think so I X'd out of that, can you I went to I went to the Field Museum, the the very famous Field Museum in Chicago with a friend who's actually here on this call. And um, we were walking around and I'm like, man, this, it's interesting that there are, there's an ex exhibit on you know, the native peoples of North America. There's an exhibit on China. There's an exhibit on Africa as a continent. But then this exhibit on Africa as a continent ends up being about African-American people. And I'm like, who are these people putting these exhibitions on and I'm like and why isn't anybody talking about white people you know we have like every other race on view in this natural history museum but we're not talking about the people who put these things on view I'm like wouldn't it be funny if there were this ethnographic um, exhibition on white people and some people thought it was funny other people did not If you would click on the National Museum of National History, it's a little baby. Oh, right here. Okay. Um, so I decided I, would, I was going to make my own museum. And I titled it the National Museum of National History. And the National Museum of National History and the iterations to date survey the cultural practices of white Americans. And um, this room that you see is actually the installation that I created, you would walk through that path and um, there were objects on the wall with labels. Um, and, 
you know, it, it isn't just a survey of the cultural practices of white Americans. I'm, I'm actually embedded in this narrative as well. Um, this living room arrangement that you see there is supposed to be the living room of Courtney Alexis, who is this young, well, now deceased, but I was named after Courtney Alexis. My mother um, was nanny to Courtney Alexis for over five years before I was born. Um, if you if you click on here, it says browse additional photos in the exhibition dossier here. Mm. It, is it at the bottom? It's on, it's on the left. It's here is in bold. It's in white. Right there. Okay. Right. Okay. You're right. It says here. There. Oh, here. Okay. Um, so this is another shot of the installation. So you're walking along, the TV is playing, it's got Barney on view. Um, if you could scroll down. There is a Chicago Blackhawks koozie with some beer in there. Um, a little tchotchke box that says go forth in the pursuit of happiness. You can scroll down. Um, and then here are these objects that the viewer could take a look at. Um, one of them is a family portrait. Scroll, if you could scroll down. And it's of these two individuals. And these are Courtney Alexis's parents, um, except these people actually didn't know each other prior to this photo shoot. I had them meet. We all met up at a JCPenney in the outskirts of Chicago. I dressed them in JCPenney clothing. I paid for a photo shoot at JCPenney and I used a baby child's bicycle helmet to be a baby bump. And this is part of the larger fixture, fiction of Courtney Alexis's family story and the National Museum of National History. You can scroll down. So the name of the exhibition that the National Museum put on is why I'm named Alexis. Um, like I said before, my mom was nanny to this little girl once upon a time um, named Courtney Alexis. She was white. And um, my mom spent a lot of time with her. And she, my mom, this was like her job, right? But it was also what she did before she had me. And because she couldn't, she didn't want to have me. She wasn't a resident at the time. She was still undocumented and was afraid that if she gave birth here without health insurance, there would be some kind of complication. She's very paranoid and that she'd be sent back. I mean, her fears were valid, but um, Courtney Alexis was always like the baby before me and almost like her firstborn child. And so you get to kind of hear and read about that as you walk through the exhibition, if you can scroll down. I wrote a press release, which I adapted from the Field Museum's press release on the Hall of uh, Native North Americans, but now I just, re I, for the most part, I just replaced the word native with white. So if I could read um, an excerpt somewhere. Uh, da, 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 da. In 2021, the National Museum of National History's white North American Hall will be transformed. Museum staff and more white American community partners are working together to renovate the hall, which has many displays that have largely stood empty. This renovated hall is representative of efforts on the museum's part to engage with North America's white community and to better represent their stories. It's not just a new exhibition. It represents a whole new way of thinking, says curator of North American anthropology, Alaka Wali. Um, and I position myself as a curator of this exhibition. Um, and my rationale is, um, if you could scroll down, my rationale is, um, oh wait, no, 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 oh, sorry, a little bit further up. Sorry, Colette. Um, this out, so this is from the press release. This outsider is head curator, Itzel Alexis Basualdo, commonly pronounced Itzel Basu Aldo. Uh, and I quote, I grew up watching white people on television and reading about them in books. My parents lived in Mississippi and Texas, so they knew the ways of the whites and experiences I never had, uh, says Basualdo. I was even partially named after a white person. I think this secondhand collective exposure can make anyone an expert on the subject. Um, that's off, obviously a joke, but it's kind of a jab at ethno ethnography and anthropology. Um, and the project goes on. This is kind of like the most solid piece of documentation of the National Museum of National History. But we, if we could listen to, or actually watch the video that was on the television, if you go back to the other tab, on your 
on Safari. Oh, here. Uh -huh. Okay. And if you click on the television or move your mouse over the television, yeah, click there. Can have play. To learn more about Barney and Friends, visit PBS online at pbskids.org. Combat troops to Central America. They are not needed. Thank you. As I say, they are not needed, and indeed, they have not been requested. We can stop there with the video. If you go on my website, any of you who are interested, the audio sounds a lot better on, if you're viewing it on your desktop. Um, and I think we're running out of time. So I yes. wanted to close. I but wanted you to promised me you would read yeah. that poem that I love. OK. So I currently have some work on view at the Frost Museum, none of which you saw here today. Um, there are photographs from my most recent trip to Mexico. Um, and while in grad school, you know, we had the mig migrant crisis caravan happening, again, the anti-immigrant rhetoric, I wrote a poem um, that was, uh, it's titled Que en Paz Descanses, Q-E-P-D, -E -E which kind of means, it's R-I-P in Spanish. Um, and actually, if you, well, I'll just read it. You can go back to my website, Colette, because it's on there if anybody wants to see it and follow along with me. Oh, wait a minute. I have to, I X'd out of it. So I'm not just like preaching here in the name of the Father, Son. Um, I grew up very, my mom is very Catholic and going to church was, it was a blessing and a curse. Like I'm undoing like all that Catholic guilt all the time, but at the same time, it's giving me, it's giving me so much to reverence and critique. Which um, tab am I looking at? Uh, the tab is da, 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 um, untitled, The Little Sun. Okay. Okay, and then I'm going to go back here, share screen. So if anyone would like to see this on person, it's currently on view at the Frost Museum on the first floor, part of an exhibition titled Otros Lados. Um, it's like a seven foot tall banner. Oh, this is at the Frost. How wonderful. Um, and so this is it. When the half Mexican in me dies and you're killing it right now, the first thing to change is that Juan Gabriel and Marco Antonio Solis will no longer make me cry. I'll stop throwing sazón in your eyes. I'll soon leave my dark hair, my hair dark. Let it clog the shower drain. I won't tell you I'm Sorry, I'll never scrub pee off a toilet bowl that is not mine. Again, that was my mother's job, not with my knees pressed to the muck on the tile. Te digo yo, not mine, and I'll never wash your dishes. Soon enough, I'll forget to call her my mother. She'll call every day when she worries I'm dead. But I won't respond because I'll forget my name is itself. It'll now be something easy, sweet simple like Susan or Ashley, but for now I am still itself and I am forgetting the Hail Mary and our father, forgetting to mistrust a drunk older man. My R stopped rolling, they sit there going dry like they've forgotten how to dance. I think by now you'll no longer want to watch. And when you've really killed me, I'll forget how much I love watching my grandmother make tortillas how I waited to eat the first one right off El Comal. 
Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. I have, we have time for one question. I have a question for you. Um, well, I have a comment as well. Uh, Somebody loves your website, as I do as well. You have a wonderful website, very creative. And then I have a question here. It says, hi, Zell. Thank you for agreeing to do this. My question for you is looking back with having worked in HR and how you use that environment so creatively, even though you wanted to work in a place where you felt like you probably would have been more inspired, like the examples you gave, what advice would you give to anyone debating on that decision, deciding whether or not they should work at a place that is outside their creative field. Totally do it. I mean, I think for a long time I was fixated on like, there is one track to achieve, you know, X. And I think that having these experiences outside of the art bubble have been incredibly enriching and important to my practice. And I think that's what adds nuance and um, makes you, not an expert, but yeah, an expert on a number of different subjects. That's not just like your craft, although there's nothing wrong with that. Right. But, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anyone else to feel small for that or to devalue their work because they're not, um, you know, working at a museum or something. Good advice. I think it's a great, like you said, it, it inspired you to do something else. You made a great art project out of it. I, I actually just love that art project. So, First of all, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, sorry we had technical difficulties, but it made it interesting at Zoom. This is a world that we're living in right now. Um, and congratulations again on Oolite and your exhibition at NSU. I can't wait to see that, hopefully. And I look forward to seeing you on the other side of this pandemic. And maybe you'll be doing something at MBUS again. Hopefully, hopefully. Thank you everyone, familiar faces for joining me. Um, thanks Colette and Embus for having me. Thank you Raymond for your help. Um, and I just unmuted everyone in case everybody would just like to say hi or virtual Hello. applause for Estelle. Thank you so Hi, much everyone. Hi, hi Bill. Thanks Hello. for being here. Yes. Thank you all for coming. And then next week, we have another art talk with Carrington Ware, which I think it's all you are going to be working with her soon on, a, on your project with Oolite. Is that correct? Uh, Carrington contributed to my project. With oh. oh, great. Well, good. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And have a great night. Stay safe and wear your mask. Thank you all. Bye. Take care. Bye. It's all.